Uh, so welcome. Now, hopefully you guys do better with my accent than my class has been for the last two days. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it turns out the Australian accent does not sit well with the French, the Swedes or the Germans, although the English don't seem to be too troubled by it. So um, what are we going to do tonight? We're here to play a game. Um, so I'd like to introduce with, you know, how did this thing come to be? I, um, I spent my life as a uh, coach and trainer with the Scale Agile Framework. Um, as a trainer, I am a big believer in experiential training or experiential learning. Um, if anybody's ever been on a SAFE course, <coughs> the people who write the SAFE materials are not big believers in experiential, they're big believers in PowerPoint. Um, and <laughs> After my first couple of courses with 300 slides to get through in two days, I said there's got to be a slightly better way to do this. <laughs> um, so I sat down to start working on writing some simulations so that we could actually get people having fun during the course instead of trying to stay awake as I hit the fast forward button on the clicker. Um, and as I wrote the simulation, it started to get out and a few other people started using it and uh, it's taken on a little bit of a life of its own. So the, um, the first part of the simulation focuses on prioritization. And in particular, portfolio and program prioritization. It's, uh, it's an area that uh, SAFE put a lot of work into. One of the things that I have found as I've used the techniques is that whether or not you're employing SAFE, the prioritization thinking is very useful. Um, and in fact, it stands alone. So we're here tonight to learn a little bit about SAFE's approach to economic prioritisation. Uh, it is based primarily on uh, Don Reinertsen's work with cost of delay um, and an interpretation of that, that that helps you get moving. So just so you know, we have about 15 minutes of PowerPoint. Uh, once the PowerPoint's done, you're going to play a game. Uh, you're going to play for about 45 minutes. Um, and then we're going to uh, top up your alcohol levels and uh, we're going to talk about what you learned. <laughs> so, let's do some theory. I'll turn my clicker on. All right. Typical prioritization in organizations. Two systems, LVD and HIPPO. Anybody care to translate the acronyms for me? Highest paid person's opinion. So that's the HIPPO system. LVD? Uh, no. <laughs> Loudest voice dominates. <laughs> okay, so now we know the way most organisations prioritise. Um, and it doesn't really matter what level you're playing at, that's the way it works. Um, it, it's, a, it's a game of politics, um, fudge business cases, uh, and, and political backbiting. That, that determines most priorities. And if we think about what we're attempting to achieve when we go to Lean, when we go to Agile, it's to say, we've got a certain amount of capacity, let's find the highest value work to achieve with that capacity. If we can't have all our priorities, we've got to pick some. Um, so somehow or other, we've got to introduce something a little bit more objective than the typical prioritization systems. Right? And the trouble that happens with most of these is these loudest voices and the highest paid person's opinions, they're the executives. And executives are used to getting their way. Um, they're particularly used to figuring out how to bypass any attempt to control them um, to find a way to make sure their stuff happens. <laughs> um, so, what do we want to do? We want to get some level of objectivity. Now, one of the tools that we use for this is the concept of the cost of delay. Um, Reinertsen, uh, some of you will be familiar with, wrote a book called The Principles of Product Development Flow, um, where basically almost the entire book is about the cost of delay and the crazy ways you can use it. Um, and his concept is the cost of delay is value foregone. Right? Value foregone over time. For every day that I do not have this thing in the market, what is it costing me? Right? If it's a cost saving initiative. How much money am I not saving every day that I don't have this thing? 
right? If it's a product I'm bringing to market that's going to generate revenue, what's the revenue I'm missing out on? Okay, that's the core thinking, right? Time as money burnt, not the money we're spending, the money we're not saving or making. And there's a couple of aspects to cost of delay which start to kind of come into being here. One of those is that cost of delay can be sensitive to time. Right? I can have seasonal influences, for example. If I'm shipping stuff in the retail market, there are four times a year that are really important to me. Right? If I get something into the market for the Christmas season, right, it's pretty time critical leading up to Christmas. If I miss Christmas, I'll wait. So that cost of delay will kind of move up and down seasonally. Right? Another example might be a legislative change. Right? A legislative change, if I don't hit a certain date, I'm in big trouble. Right? The fines are going to come along. <laughs> There's no bonus for coming early. So my cost of delay is actually zero <laughs> until I miss the date and then it's a lot. <laughs> um, so it's, it's a little bit nuanced. Right? It's what am I losing, but it's also what am I losing as it's sensitive to time. And this concept of cost of delay is the thing that we want to start to incorporate in the way that we prioritise work. Right? Agile for a long time has preached, prioritised by value. And we've preached it and we've preached it and we've preached it. How many people in the room are working with Agile organisations that do really good value-based prioritisation? <laughs> We've got one game person. <laughs> okay, so 16 years now, we've been preaching prioritised by value. <laughs> Room with 50 or 60 Agilists, we've got one on hand. Uh, why, why don't we do it? It's hard. Sorry? It's hard. Because no one really understands what value is. Yeah. Nobody really understands value? Anybody else? Political. It's political. <laughs> Values in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> Any others? Sorry? It's like if they don't necessarily want to quantify the value because that's what someone will have to guess the word. Ah, yes, right. <laughs> okay, values for business to worry about. You IT folk, just get on with your job. Mm. Uh, there's a little bit of that as well. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> cost delay, value foregone over time. Now, if we're going to prioritise, it's not quite enough, right? Because just prioritising by value is a, is a kind of one-dimensional thing. Firstly, value itself is multi-dimensional. It's different things to different people. Um, but, but secondly, it's a little bit nuanced. So the second thing that Reinertsen focuses on is, of course, cost, right? Because if we're trying to maximise return on investment, we need to understand the value proposition and the cost. Um, and the cost, if I'm living in a lean world, which is really all about time and speed to market, cost is the time that I block a resource. Okay? A resource that could be doing something else valuable, <laughs> how long am I going to block that resource? If I want to get to economic prioritisation across the portfolio of work, I need to understand what's the value proposition on the table um, and what's the cost. And the cost is not how many dollars am I spending, it's what am I tying up. Uh, different parts of the organisation, some very expensive things, sometimes some very scarce things. So the, the proposal is that I, that I bring these two things together. I take my cost of delay, I take my cost, bring the two into some kind of shared focus and I have an opportunity to prioritise. Uh, now, there are two acronyms that run around when it comes to bringing these things together. Uh, the first is the acronym SAFE Users. It calls it weighted shortest job first. So weighted shortest job first, it is a combination of the cost of delay and the duration, um, and it's just a ratio. Cost of delay divided by duration equals my weighted shortest jobs first. And that's a nice big mouthful. So some people call it WSJF, it's still a bit of a mouthful. Um, WSJF is a pronunciation many of us use. Um, I did work with one organisation that called it What Would Jesus Fund? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
The, the, the other acronym that runs around um, is uh, CD3. Cost of delay divided by duration. Uh, same, same formula, <laughs> uh, different acronyms, different authors. So, who likes maths? Hey, a few people are going to enjoy this slide. Now, <laughs> has anybody ever been on a Don Wrightson course? One, do you have to do a lot of maths? <laughs> yeah. So, Wrightson, who, who coined all of this stuff, he's an economist, so you can't read much of his stuff without having to do a little bit of maths. Um, and he has lots of mat mathematical proofs. <laughs> um, and in fact, when you get into all of his mat mathematical proofs, cost delay is an incredibly powerful thing. It's useful for far more than just prioritization. Right? You know how we run around in the lean circle for years and we say, you know, don't run 100% utilization economically optimal for 80% or 70%, cost of delay can actually give you the maths to financially prove it. Right? <laughs> so long as you can turn it into hard dollars. <laughs> so what Reinertson preaches is develop a fully monetized cost of delay model, get it blessed by your finance organization, and then run your whole company based on cost of delay trade-offs. And, and you get to this point of saying, okay, I can look at a feature, uh, I can come up with cost of delay, $10,000 a week, $8,000 a week, $20,000 a week. I can come up with a duration, how long it's gonna take me. Um, and, and I can use the pair of these to start to calculate my, my uh, ratings. Okay, so it's simple division, 10 divided by six, 1.66. That's my Wischief rating. Highest Wischief rating is what I do first. So the recommended order here, I do B, then I do A, then I do C. Follow the maths. <laughs> right? So I do B first. It's $8,000 a week and I've got to wait three weeks to do it. Therefore, I've got a cost of delay of $24,000 before I get feature B. I come along to feature A. Well, that's $10,000 a week, but I have to wait the three weeks that I was in the queue behind feature A, plus the six weeks, oh, sorry, behind feature B, plus the six weeks for feature A. So, cost of delay, $90,000, continue doing maths, eventually $614,000 lost money. Alternatively, I take a simplistic view that says, forget the time, we'll just run on cost of delay. Um, in that case, I actually wait for $740,000 lost. Okay, so pretty simple maths. I've just saved myself about $130,000 by applying this prioritization formula. So life's good when I've got all these hard numbers. <laughs> right? This is the simplest and easiest stuff you can do with cost of delay. You then keep taking these numbers and say, this is why when I employ my TIBCO programmers, I'm going to hold them at 60% utilization because that's the best thing for the company. <laughs> and I've got the maths to prove it. But it's hard. <laughs> really, really hard. Now, if you're interested in what happens when you get fully quantified stuff, um, Josh Arnold, uh, Black Swan Farming, a couple of you in the room might be familiar with their work. They've done fully quantified stuff. Um, they did it with the Maersk shipping line and they published a case study on some incredibly powerful things they did with it. Um, I've never managed to get there. Because the trouble is when it's hard, people don't try. <laughs> right? We can't get fully quantified cost of delay, certainly not at the feature level. Let's not do it. <laughs> we'll stick with loud and voice dominates because we're pretty good at that. So, what Wrightson has to say is we don't have to be perfect, we've just got to be better. Right? If I can't get fully quantified, get something better than what I got today. Right? All kinds of things will make me better than I am at the moment, because right now the bar's really low. <laughs> when you look at the approach to economic prioritisation taken in most corporate portfolios, the bar is incredibly low. I worked with a big telco in Australia that did an analysis on their business case performance. 
Um, and they looked at the business cases put up for about 12 months worth of spend and the projected benefits and the realized benefits, there was a $5 billion gap between what they projected their return was going to be on those business cases and what they actually got. Because right? we've got really no hard science, there's no gates, you put a good fudgy business case up that's got some convincing pretend mathematics behind it, you get approval, you spend the money and nobody ever talks to you again. Um, so, we've got to do a little bit better. Do a little bit better. The approach the Scale Agile framework takes is to say, let's use a proxy. Right? A proxy that starts the discussion, starts us thinking objectively about cost of delay. As we use the proxy, we'll get better at using the proxy. And if we're really good, eventually we'll throw the proxy away because we'll get to the point where we do hard numbers. So, suggest a proxy. When we think of cost of delay, let's think about the cost of delay holistically. Three key components. Direct business value, revenue, cost savings. Timing sensitivity, indirect value. Right? If I do this, then I can do that. If I do this, it reduces the risk of that. Put those components together, I get a cost of delay proxy. I need a proxy for duration. If I'm in Agile, size and story points is a reasonable proxy for duration. So, now I've got a proxy. So let's dig a little bit deeper. What do we think about in those three levers? Well, in, uh, in user or business value, we're thinking about revenue impact, potential penalties, customer preferences, um, time criticality, fixed deadlines, uh, are customers willing to wait for us, how much pain is it currently causing our customers, what are our competitors doing, uh, risk and opportunity, what will I learn, what will it do to reduce my risk profile, this application we've got that's on hardware that's 20 years old, and when that hardware is in trouble, we buy our spare parts from museums. <laughs> is there a risk reduction value proposition in, in retiring this application? <laughs> I need to think seriously about the indirect value as well as the direct. So, three levers. How do I get some numbers? All right, I've still got to at some point put some numbers on these things. Well, we borrow a trick from Agile, relative estimation, okay? If we can get the right group of stakeholders to provide relative estimates on the components of cost of delay, we have relative estimates on size, we can come up with some numbers that gives us a base for movement. So, that is the theory. <laughs> Time for some practice. So we're gonna play a simulation. Who's not got a seat? One couple of people? Have we got some spares? We've got a spare up here, spare there. <laughs> All right. So, here's the simulation. Give you a chance to practice it. Um, you are a property development company. Um, as a property development company, You've bought up a bunch of farms a couple of away, hours away from the nearest major city. You've bulldozed the farms and you're going to build a city. <laughs> uh, having travelled through England for the first time, it's a little bit harder to imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Works pretty well in America and Australia. <laughs> so, I'm going to create this satellite city. And as a property developer, I'm going to make money by building stuff and selling it. Uh, what am I going to build? I'm going to build houses and I'm going to build shops. Um, and I want to maximise my money by building those houses and shops in the right order to create this little thriving uh, new world city. I've got reasonable but not excessive cash reserves, so I've got to make sure I'm generating a good cash flow as I'm going. Um, so what I've done is I've sent my market research people out to say, what should we be building? And they've done a little bit of research and they've come up with some major ideas. And these ideas come in the form of things like residential housing estates and shopping centres. And they've done enough market research to get some clues to the demand 
and some clue as to the potential value or the return that I'm going to get on these things. And uh, your job in this simulation is to assess the cost of delay on the various things that they've identified um, and get us to a point where we can make some decisions about the priorities. So, to this end, you each have nine <coughs> epics on your table. These epics are these ideas the marketing people have come up with. So, you got a little bit of information. Some of you will recognize the elevator pitch. <laughs> All right, what's the pitch for the idea? Um, we've also got some marketing guesstimates as to the potential amount of money we'll make sitting up here in the estimated value. All right. Now, marketing people make interesting guesses about value and returns. So, you know, we have convinced them to hedge their bets with a little bit of ranging. You may or may not believe the bets. Um, we also, of course, have some space for you to fill in some values as you work your way through the cost of delay. Uh, finish the maths. So, what's your job? Working as a group at your table, review all the epics. There are nine of them. Um, take your time, make sure you understand the big picture. So, you may choose to just read them silently and pass them around. You may choose to read them to each other. Um, from a noise management perspective, once we kick off, one or two tables might decide you'd rather work outside on the cafeteria tables. You can sneak an extra drink while you're doing that one. <laughs> uh, once you've worked your way through and you actually understand all the epics in front of you, um, you're going to work through systematically one at a time. Right? You're going to start with business value. From a business value perspective, you need to understand relative values. Now, what do you do? Well, we go to our friend, the planning poker system. Relative estimation, what do we do? We find the smallest thing first. Smallest thing in our case, lowest business value. Call that the one. You've all got textures you can write the one on. Once we've identified the one, we go through epic by epic. Compared to the one, how valuable is this? And quite handily, you all have planning poker cards. So, who in the room has used planning poker before? All right, there's at least one at every table. <laughs> the one at every table, your job is to help your table mates use planning poker. All right, now what we're going to do is we're going to use planning poker to get a collaborative estimate on relative value. Unlike regular, regular planning poker, second vote majority wins. So there's no continuing to debate until you're aligned because otherwise we'd be here at breakfast tomorrow. Um, you do a vote. You have a discussion, you do a second vote, second vote, majority rules, write the number down, move on. Uh, we are not playing for sheep stations. So, once you've got all the business value done, you move on to timing criticality. Again, your job, find the one. What's the least time critical epic in front of you? Set the one, relative estimation. Move lens again, move on to the interact value. Risk reduction opportunity enablement. Find the one, relative estimation. At that point, it's just maths. <laughs> Do the final calculations and away you go. Now, the size has been pre-calculated for you. You should ignore the size when you're talking about value. Right? That's going to come in in the maths. All you're focused on in your relative estimation for cost delay is what's the value proposition. What's the right value proposition from a timing sensitivity, an indirect value, and a direct value perspective? And by the way, there's a great big hint when it comes to the business value. It's sitting there on the card. <laughs> right? um, so don't go making numbers up too much. But of course, you might not trust my marketing people. Okay, so you'll have 45 minutes for this. Um, what questions do you have for me before you begin? What I, don't quite, I don't quite know how we organise it, but if any of you want to make up a full set of cards before you go, you can take the packs away. You can, right? so, yeah, we'll that out. 
Uh, what, what other questions do you have for me before you begin? Okay, so if I look out the door, there's still lots of wine. <laughs> you probably have to BYO your chairs. <laughs> uh, join a couple of tables together. There's room for three of you to move out there. It'd probably be a little bit friendlier for you in terms of noise value as well. <laughs> My suggestion would be if you're going to move, you probably come from the middle of the room. Um, and that just creates a little bit of separation. Um, I'll be wandering around. Dave Eva, wherever he's wound up sitting, will also be wandering around uh, to help you when you get stuck. Um, have fun. Uh, we, we now have results in... Have you guys finished your maths? <laughs> okay, so while you're finishing your maths, first thing we're going to do is just see where we finished. So I'm going to go table by table. I'd like you to read me your top four and your bottom two. Uh, let's start in the <laughs> back corner over there. So we, we need quiet because not everybody has a loud voice like me. Okay, coming forwards. Top, two. Top, four. Top four. Top four, right, sorry. Uh, Wits Supermarket, Queen Tech Park, O'Neill Monster Hall, and the Blue Downtown Shopping Strip. And the bottom two will be Rich People's Homes and the Green Leisure and Health. Okay, coming forwards. So here we've got the Wits Supermarket, the Blue Downtown Shopping Strip, uh, Extreme Psychology Park. And your bottom two? Interesting. Coming over. Wood supermarket, the shopping strip, skilled accommodation, technology park, and the wall are rich rich and the leisure and health. Okay, coming around. Wood supermarket, extreme technology park. Okay, coming around. Wood supermarket, shopping strip, leisure and health, and then the technology park. And then we've got Rich and Rich and the O'Neill's uh, Monster Mall. Okay, next. Interesting. Uh, lucky last. Okay, so a little bit of variation, but some kind of common themes there. Right, you'll notice nobody really likes the Richie Rich folks. <laughs> We'd definitely rather drink alcohol than go to a health centre. <laughs> um, the supermarket gets a Guernsey pretty much everywhere. Um, and in a couple of things are a little bit more variable. So let me ask you a question. How do you like the result you got? Don't like it. Don't like Hands up if you don't really like the result. Okay, so some hands and some people who probably don't want to vote. Um, <laughs> what, what, what don't you like? Something that would have made sense. Services, but not much accommodation. Lots of services, not much housing. Yeah, something that would make sense in terms of strategy. Okay. So a lot of people worried about lots of infrastructure and nobody living there? Yeah. Is that kind of the common thing? Okay, so that's a little bit of a concern, right? <laughs> We're going to have deep pockets. Well, one of the things you will notice um, when you look at your cards is they all have this little picture on them here. Some of them have a picture that looks like a house. Some look like a shopping trolley. <laughs> what I'd like you to do is I'd like to take your list and separate it into two. Maintain the order.
So, so what, what you now have, right, is you have commercial on one side and residential on the other. All right. This is an opportunity for us to overlay some strategy. We don't necessarily want just a stack ranked list. We might need to have some strategic consideration based on our expertise as property developers, which I'm sure we're all experts at, um, as to how to balance our investment. Are we going to have a, an equal investment in residential and commercial? Are we going to go heavy one way early and then heavy the other way late? What we now have is a priority within each of those strategic areas. Okay, so I'm applying a couple of strategic overlay tools. So if I'm thinking right at the portfolio level, I'm, I'm thinking about how do I spend my investment capacity. <laughs> As a property developer, I've got two areas of strategic investment, commercial and residential. Roughly how much do I spend in each area? Okay, I could still use this tool to look holistically at everything in the portfolio, but I just stick an overlay on it. Right? Now I've got an, an order of approach in each of those areas. So let me ask another question. How many of you at some point in this exercise talked about what kind of city you were going to build? We mentioned it and then moved on. Okay. <laughs> Mention it, moved on. Both the back tables suggested they had a chat. When did you have your chat? Okay, so you had a cheaper or expensive. Was that an early conversation or a late conversation? About the middle, you thought about what kind of town it would be. How about you guys over there? Right, so about the middle, you stopped and thought, actually, we should think about what kind of town it's going to be. Yep, uh, up here? Okay, so going about the middle. Right, now, think back to Agile. Start with a big vision. <laughs> Paint the detail. When do you think you should have had the conversation about what kind of city you were going to build? Right, right at the beginning. <laughs> I gave you some detail and you all dived into it. <laughs> Why? Because we love to dive into detail. <laughs> right, before I'm going to use this, I've got to have some clue what my strategy is. What kind of town am I building? What's my investment strategy? <laughs> now when I start to think about my value drivers, I'm a little bit more informed. Okay, um, so you, you can't just use a formula with no vision. <laughs> um, so, so which, um, considering a particular strategy, which of the three values does that have an influence on? All of them. All of them. Absolutely. Okay, so if, if I was doing a safe talk right now, I'd talk about what we did in safe for that. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Somewhere before I start thinking about my priorities, I've got to think about what my vision is. If I'm a portfolio, whose vision is it? Okay, so w let's come back to the dependency question. If I'm a portfolio, whose vision is it? Executives. Right? If I don't know my executive vision, I've got no chance of executing. So somehow or other, before I start playing with priorities of, of initiatives, I've got to get some kind of alignment around what's our vision. Right? Some tools that help me as I start to execute. Because then I can start to think about how does this contribute to my st strategy. <laughs> right? Otherwise, I'm kind of a little bit in the dark. <laughs> and most of you had made half your votes before you thought about what kind of vision you had. <laughs> in fact, some of you never really got to a vision. Comment over the back. Yes. That that that's okay though, right? It's still a vision. Right. Okay, so there's all kinds of different approaches. To be honest, when I wrote this, <laughs> um, 
many, many years ago, when I had a few less grey hairs in my beard, I lived in California. And I lived in a town that was halfway between Los Angeles and San Diego. And every weekend I drove up to Los Angeles to party with my friends in LA. Um, and as I drove, I drove through the desert and I watched these towns appear. <laughs> because it's actually kind of the way they do it over there. Some company comes along and they buy a block of desert <laughs> and, they <laughs> and they build a city. <laughs> uh, and that was kind of the inspiration in my head. Um, and in reality, th this kind of city, the, the, tech, the rural technology hub, is what's starting to dominate over in the US. Um, but you know, you gotta have some vision. If you've got no vision, or you're gonna have a very random set of answers. So, let's ask another question. Um, what struck you during the exercise? I'll probably work with hands so we can be a little bit more lean. Okay, we've got one here and then that one. Danger that when you're thinking about business value, yep. what you inadvertently do, inadvertently, is you start thinking about time and value, and you start thinking about risk reduction and opportunity enablement. Right. And, and you only realise you've done that when you get there. So in future, when I do this, I will reverse the order, and I will ask people to think about risk reduction and opportunity enablement first. Get that out of the way, then move on to. Okay, so you feel, you feel that might help. Go to business value. Right. And I'll reverse the order. And I think actually, I will even suggest to Dean that they reverse the order. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Okay, so it struck you the, the difficulty in separation. Absolutely. Who, who else found it hard to separate concerns? Yeah. In a way, it's just what you were saying. I think it's the vision. So if you set a vision, yep. then you know what the community likes. Okay. So All right, so a little bit of, little bit of thought there. Um, Comment. Yeah, I guess we were, uh, when we looked at the finished list, we, we kind of saw that it doesn't look right. Yep. And the first analysis was like, oh, yeah, actually the, the smaller sizes ended up on the top. If we could take some of the biggest sizes and break them down and actually deliver some of the, of the housing. Oh, that'd be handy, wouldn't it? That would have come on the, on the top. So that was the, the first, the next thing we would have done would have looked at how can we break down big things to smaller things. Right. So this is one of the things I love about this formula right, is if I want to climb the list, I've got to come up with higher value, smaller ideas. <laughs> okay, you're bringing, and it, you, who's bringing an idea to the table? It's some stakeholder, <laughs> a really important idea. <laughs> but we've got a model, if you want to climb the model, find a smaller idea, right? Trim off some of the, the junk <laughs> in your big idea, because then you get a better answer. So it actually encourages you to go back and start to peel away to find the smaller, more valuable things. Um, so, yeah, as intended. One of the things about this is they're all very distinct epics. Yes. I would have gone for a vertical slice, done a mixed use um, development, and put that in first. Right. So, n not necessarily smaller, but a little bit of everything. So, a little bit of everything. So, you would have sliced your epics differently? Yeah. Okay. How many of your customers slice their ethics like that? Not enough. Right. <laughs> so this is reality, right? You, you can translate epic in this context, generally turns into kind of a project, <laughs> right? An epic in SAFE is somewhere between two and 10 million bucks. <laughs> what, what turns up? People's hobby horses. <laughs> They're never vertically sliced. Well, you might be able to slice that, but you know, we, we don't have enough time for that part of this simulation. <laughs> Comment over the back. Um, have you done this exercise with this on both, which is pretty hard as well as you can put? Just see whether, you know, the, 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 the bridge here is the, the so, so have I done it differently? Um, no. Did I want to? Not particularly. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I, I don't really care what, what the answer is. Um, what I care about is creating a conversation. 
I want a conversation. I want a group to rigorously examine value. All I want is a tool to help that. Do you guys feel like you're rigorously examined value? Yeah. Yeah, within the time constraints. Yeah. So, so, so you, you might not have been particularly qualified for it, <laughs> but pretty rigorous. And, and let me tell you, some groups get really fired up about supermarkets. <laughs> the debates I've seen happen over those supermarkets have been interesting to watch. <laughs> okay. So, so let's come back. I, I, I've got you, but I'm going to... Actually, let's go now. Um, so I suppose the overriding feeling I had through the exercise is that um, adding numbers together that are not related are on the same scale. Yep. Oh, and then I'm dividing by a number which may relate to duration but may not. Mm. And then I'm thinking how is this answer? Right. So... And I, I accept what you're saying with value is we all had a really deep conversation about the intensities. Yep. That's to me is like people saying, well, estimating is not terribly valuable, but we have had a conversation about it. It's a lot of people say about estimating. Well, it's not estimating that's important, it's the fact we talk about it. So why don't we just talk about it? We're trying we're putting some numbers on here which I so Okay, so let's 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 play with a couple of aspects of that comment. All right. So let's take with the first one. We're adding numbers together on different scales. Okay, that's, that's one a couple of groups noticed on the way. Uh, now there's one of the things that I notice in this exercise, generally I see a lot more 20s in timing criticality than I do in every other lever, <laughs> right? It's really easy to rush to a sense of urgency. It's less easy to rush to high values anywhere else. And really, do I want my sense of timing criticality and indirect value proposition to carry equal weighting with my direct value? Probably not. Right? What, what's the right way to weight it? That varies depending on context. I don't actually work with any client who goes one plus one plus one. Okay? So I might go one plus half plus half. Um, we, we'll figure that out. So the, the reason if you compare it with my mistake is that, okay, I could see that indirect value and business value, where business value is just cash, yep. could be put on the same scale and could be added together. Yep. But timing criticality comes from how rapidly that value is decaying. Yes. And that is, that is what you have to separately look at. It's saying, okay, you've got all that value, now how fast is it decaying? That's the next the so, so you may enrich it. You, you may enrich it. So, and this is the, the extra hint I'd give. Do I weight everything equally? Application question. Are those the right three levers? Application question. Right? What do I want to do? I want to think about what drives value for us. Now I can tell you most of my customers don't do user and business value. They do business value and user value as separate levers. I have a university that uses it. They have student value and business value. I have a telecom that uses it. They have customer value and business value, right? Because they are important separations from them. Um, you, you don't necessarily go with Dean's levers. <laughs> what you need to go with is what are the right things for us to consider in terms of what drive cost of delay for our organisation. <laughs> Dean gave us a start. Dean gave us a start that said, think about the components. Now, don't think about 14 components. I've seen that. It's ugly. <laughs> <laughs> think about the three, four, five major components that drive cost of delay for you. That's what you want to know. Do you want to use Dean's timing criticality or do you want to go back and use Josh's and the Black Swan Farming approaches to timing curves? Well, there's even an Okay, so let me let me dig into that. In the end, isn't it just a little bit of a 
So, so, so I'll be honest in, so I understand what fully quantified cost of Laker give me. Uh, I love it. <laughs> um, it is so far beyond my clients, right, that it's immeasurable golf. What, what I want is something that helps them move forward. I want them to feel like it's objective. I want them to feel like they've had a measured discussion. Most of all, I want alignment. I want a tool that helps alignment. Now, let's come back on alignment. Whether or not you agree with the specific levers Dean uses. So a few people have said it was pretty tough to separate them. Right? The people who didn't say it was tough to separate them, I'd suggest you were probably lying. Because <laughs> it is, it's really tough. Value is a complex thing. What drives it is cognitive bias. Right? We all inherently have cognitive bias towards certain aspects of value. Some of us have a cognitive bias that's completely driven by time and criticality. <laughs> it's the only thing we think about. Which executive is screaming? What's their name and how important are they? That's my driver. <laughs> if I'm an architect, are probably not really driven by business value. <laughs> I'm thinking about risk and opportunity. You always promise to decommission these systems, you never do. <laughs> you never give me a voice. Right? So value for me is some crazy mix of all of these components. Right? I was an architect, I've probably got a horrible mix. <laughs> value for every single person in this room is some other mix. If we're trying to get to alignment, talking about value as one number, we've got no hope. Right? It's really like that simple. To get to true alignment where we're just going, what's a value number? It's not going to happen. Because what's, what's happening, right? These epics we've got, we've got a group of stakeholders at the table, each of whom cares about that epic, and they want to make sure that you know there's a hundred million dollars on the table and they want their 40. <laughs> and there's 10 of them. <laughs> I, I've got to get somehow to them to agree what's the best way for the company to spend a hundred million bucks? Or a hundred million pounds. Sorry, I should get local. <laughs> um, so, so we've got to have a tool. We've got to have a tool that lets us have a simpler discussion. And that's the value of a model. It separates the discussion. I don't have to deal with all my cognitive biases. I can just pull out one lever, have a discussion, come into alignment on that lever. I can pull out another lever, have a discussion, come into alignment on that lever. Right? Come into alignment one step at a time. I might completely ignore the numbers at the end. I've done it. I had a group of product managers go through an intense and long numerical voting system Got a little bit crazy at times. I had product managers running a billion dollar a year product line, sticking planning poker cards on their foreheads. <laughs> we got to the end, they completely discarded the order. But it took them about five minutes to agree on the new order. The first discussion with that group, I thought I was dead. <laughs> One of them came on one of my courses and played this game and said, I think that'll help us, Mark, can you come? <laughs> um, and these guys, it was kind of a major business, and I went into their first discussion. We said, okay, we're not going to go too hard. We're just going to see if we can get a vision and strategy lever discussion going on. And what I found was a, a room, so their exec sat in the middle, <laughs> and then there were three camps. Enterprise, small business and consumer, and international. Enterprise made almost no money, but they drove all the volume that allowed them to maintain their network. <laughs> consumer and small business made lots of money, had almost no volume, and they had no ability to exist without the volume that supported the network from enterprise. The international guys just wanted to be not forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> 
And their execs sat there and she just played them off against each other. Um, and I went, oh, how are we going to do this? Um, and we teased and we teased and we got to a bit of a strategy and a definition and we played planning poker and we had stupidity with cards stuck on foreheads. We got to an answer, they threw away all the maths, resorted it. It was literally about 15 minutes we had an order for their CapEx spend for the next year. Because they'd have enough discussion along the way, they had enough objectivity and shared understanding to get to an aligned position on how to spend their money. That's the purpose of the tool. Right? Now, making the numbers mean something. I kind of want that. <laughs> right? The first thing I want is alignment. Because the way most prioritization discussions happen is we get in the room and we make some priorities and then everybody walks out the door. What are most of them doing while they're walking out the door? Sorry? Forgetting about them? Shaking their heads. Shaking their heads. What else? Planning how they can get that feature raised up there. Planning how they can break it. <laughs> right? 30 seconds. That's how long most priorities discuss. Oh, most priorities last. So there's a really nice quote from Reinertsen that, that suggests that priorities based in economics tend to be much more durable. I want durability. Now, I can get to better numbers, right? Here, we were playing guesswork. <laughs> right, I watched the city go next to me. Um, I remember driving to and from the States when I was much younger, whatever the case might be. I've got tools. So one of the tools I might have is to start to talk about what do we talk about in each lever. So I might turn around and say, what contributes to business value, time and criticality, opportunity and risk? This was a slightly desensitized version of what came out of that first workshop with my friends who like to argue with each other. <laughs> and then we started to have some actual hard numbers. Right. One of the tricks, if I try to fully quantify cost of delay, is there's some qualitative stuff that's hard to, let, to, to keep alive when I, when I fully quantify. Um, I actually personally really like the relative stuff. I just like the relative stuff to be based on numbers and information. So what we found as we worked our way through the workshops with this group, the interesting insight at the end of it, so I had about 15 of them with votes about 20 in the room. Because what happened, right, I had the group product manager from each line <laughs> and their staff and their staff. <laughs> um, so the first layer of staff got a vote, the second layer of staff were in the room. <laughs> Let me tell you who influenced the votes. The bottom layer. Because the bottom player knew the numbers. <laughs> we got some feature about, you know, um, What's happening in China? Well, what are our competitors doing in China? Oh, well, these guys are doing this, these guys are doing that. Um, what's our churn rate on customers? Now we're losing 10% of our customer base a month to that client over there. Oh, that's important. <laughs> right. what, are, what are the real numbers we're talking about? Okay. You, you, you've generally, if you've got the right people in the room, you guys are not the right people. You'll probably never be the right people. I'll certainly never be the right person. <laughs> the right people in the room know the numbers about their business. Or they know how to bring people who'll have the numbers so that we can have an objective argument based on numbers. The more numbers I bring, the more likely I am to win in terms of justifying a value proposition for my bright ideas. Figure, what happens is people start to bring data. And we start to move our organisation towards actually having data-based discussions about value propositions. All right? Begins with poker cards on forwards. <laughs> now, what else did you notice? Quite often, the, the range of numbers was quite dramatic. Lots of twos and twenties. Sometimes, yeah. Anybody else experience that? Yep. What tended to happen when there was a dramatic range? You sat in the middle. How did you get to a middle? 
Discussion? Anything else? Right. Sometimes some averaging. People kind of moving towards the middle of compromise. At the end of the day, me standing over you, beating your heads with climbers. Um, who got to know each other better during that exercise? Who got to know what different people in your group valued? And a little bit about how they thought. Right? When you understand people better, it's kind of easier to align with them. Because you start to understand what they're bringing to the table and the thinking that's going on there in their head before they put an option out. It's again another reason why we use the tool. Create the discussion, build relationships. Right? What happened with the product management group? The group product manager over here learned how good the junior product managers were over there. <laughs> and, and they started to, to kind of trust that, that, that input. Right? Here we're playing a game, real life it's just the same. Okay, so we're a little bit over, I'm gonna wrap. Um, where to from here? So, further reading. There is no better source than Don Reinertsen. I should have had him on this slide. <laughs> um, who's read Principles of Product Development Flow? Who's read it at least three times? Three. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a tough book. <laughs> it's a great book. <laughs> but warning, if you haven't read it, you'll need to read it three times. <laughs> Um, it might, it might be worth mentioning, just chipping in, we've got a, uh, if Don is actually coming here, if you want a three day course later on for events to that day, so if anyone's interested in this, we go on that, then um, just look on the website and you can sign up for that. So, so I can tell you it's a great course, but bring your caffeine. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely your calculator. Um, where else to go? Really good stuff on the way this all works, go to Black Swan Farming. Right, these guys are cutting edge. Yeah. Now, interestingly enough, when you talk to them, right, they go for fully quantified. When you talk to them, their whole tool for facilitation is actually reveal assumptions, which is kind of the same way this works. <laughs> right, they go for a number, we use a proxy. Um, to be honest, for me, a little bit of both. <laughs> I like Dean's stuff with their timing curves. <laughs> That's where I think you're probably in the sweet spot. <laughs> Um, but definitely some really great material there. Um, I've blogged about it a bit, so my blog is here. I'll be putting this slide deck somewhere that you guys can see it on AWA. Um, so you can come back to it. Um, the, the, the three levers and all the components we had is on my blog. Um, now, the simulation also is open source. So I developed it as a training tool. I use it for coaching. Uh, this is actually layer one of three layers. Um, it's open source if you'd like to use it. There's a facilitation guide. The soft copy materials, you can print your own. It's too expensive, you'll never buy it from me if you buy it from me. <laughs> Printing's not cheap. Laminating's really painful. <laughs> uh, but, if, but if you'd like it, um, it's easy to download, easy to run. Um, so I use it internally as a coaching tool an awful lot. I've got a group, I want to get them prioritising, we come and play this game and then we say let's have a look at your backlog. <laughs> um, not your story backlog. Uh, this is not for stories. This is for serious stuff. Um, so you know, it's a, it's a good intro tool. Um, the link to it. So the version we're playing tonight's a recent upgrade I haven't written the new facilitation guides for. Uh, so the old version is what's currently linked to on my blog. I'll have facilitation guides for this one in the next week or two. <laughs> uh, it's just changed a little bit in evolution. So thank you for coming tonight. I hope you've got some interesting takeaways and insights. Um, thank you AWA for giving me the chance to, to play games in London. Um, Simon, Dave, did you want to close? <laughs>